Okay, so first of all, thank you all for coming out on this miserably rainy day and being part of our very first speaker series event for this semester. Um, we are really delighted with the lineup that we have this semester, so please, uh, please take a look. Any, any students that are taking this for credit, if you, oh, great, okay, so just check in with, on the way out, just check in with the folks at the front desk and we'll make sure that everything is, is proper and formalized so that, uh, so that you're enrolled in, in the course. For those of you who are, who are just here for information and knowledge, we, we welcome you, faculty, friends, uh, and anyone else who decided this was worth coming out for and I don't think you will be disappointed. So I'm Donna Gentile O'Donnell. I'm the special, uh, the special assistant to the president and the senior vice president for innovation partnerships and programs. Um, I'm, I'm happy to welcome you today on behalf of the innovation pillar, Dr. Rose Ritz, our EVP for all things innovation. Heather Rose, our rock star. These are just some of my colleagues. Kathy Biedenbaugh, Rob Puglis is back there. We're all delighted to welcome you to innovation today and for this, uh, for this special presentation. Before, um, before I bring up our speaker, who is Tim Armour, uh, Tim is the president and CEO of the Cure Alzheimer's Fund. There's been an ongoing conversation at Jefferson about venture philanthropy, and we thought, you know what, how about we get somebody who is actually engaged in a, a version of venture philanthropy that's pretty meaningful. And Tim has a great story to tell, and he's doing some really, really marvelous work. But before uh, I bring Tim to the podium, what I'd like to do is run a short clip for you, which will give you a little background of the history of the Morbys, uh, Jacqueline Morby and her husband, who were the founders of, of Cure ALZ. So, Kathy, could you start that, please? This was working. Honest to God, it was. I was actually going to bring Tim up right after this. Yeah. Um, all right. So no, no network. Okay. So you, all of you from Jefferson know that occasionally we have network connection issues, and apparently we're having one at the moment. Hold on one second. I'm hoping we can show this to you because it's incredibly moving and, uh, and historically instructive on the motivations that, that have driven um, this really remarkable enterprise that's based in Pittsburgh. We're a go. Up louder. Sound need up. Sound up. Lower corner right. Up. A 
Apologies, we are, we are, I think, quite close. Oh, goodness. All right, it looks like the, it looks like the gremlins have moved in um, and have taken over the computer. <laughs> You know what? Let's just move to Tim's presentation, and then maybe maybe we can end with the with this. So, um, so Tim, I think probably the best thing for us to do is is hope that we can end the presentation with this very moving clip. Um, oh, do, do you think you have it? Or no? Okay. So, so rather than hold everyone up, um, we'll have to sort of do history later and uh, the present in the present. And we, we are so very fortunate to have uh, Tim Armour join us to talk about the amazing work. I, I did get a chance to talk to him a little earlier about some of the researchers that they have funded out of Stop ALZ. And uh, actually, one of them was uh, here at Jefferson for a lot of years, who's now up in Mount Sinai. So I'm sure Tim will be talking about that as well. Please join me in welcoming Tim Armour. Great, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to a beautiful day in the Commonwealth here in Pennsylvania. It's delightful that you're all here. Thank you for braving the weather. Um, I am also delighted to be here to address, I think, two pillars of Thomas Jefferson, innovation and philanthropy, uh, and we'll try to tie those together in a way that makes some sense to you. First of all, let me, uh, you understand who I am a little bit from the background there, but I want to know a little bit more about who you guys are. Are there any doctors, MDs, researchers in the audience? Uh-oh. Okay. Well, that changes everything. Okay. Um, uh, uh, and those of you who have unfortunately uh, been exposed to this, uh, this disease through family or acquaintances, how many of those do we have here? Yeah, that's a lot. Um, and, and pretty typical. So my first disclosure given my first question is, I am not a doctor or a researcher, uh, but I work closely with them. I even, don't even represent one on television, but I do work uh, very closely with them. Our mission at Cure Alzheimer's Fund is to raise money uh, to give to researchers to try to break the back of this disease. So what we'd like to talk with you about today is some innovative approaches to raising this money and to distributing it and uh, about some of those researchers that are doing some phenomenal work for us. Um, this is a long list of things that we're going to touch on today. Uh, we won't go into great detail <laughs> on really any of these things, but uh, my colleague John Slattery is here. John, you can raise your hand, and we'll be around afterwards a little bit, so if there's any of this that we've skipped over too lightly for you, we're happy to stay and chat with you a little bit afterwards. First of all, the first thing to be said, and we can skip over this really quickly because you are all very well informed, this is a bad thing. Uh, Alzheimer's is a very, very bad thing. And up on the screen is, is some ideas uh, of some of the highlights about why it's a bad thing. Um, one of the things that, uh, uh, that you may not realize is several bullets down, um, well, I guess it's not on this slide, so I'll go to the next one. But, uh, the, the numbers are just huge. In terms of federal help for Alzheimer's, the, uh, the government through Medicare and Medicaid pays out about $277 billion last year uh, for care. At the same time, they were investing about $2 billion in research through NIH. That's not a great ratio. Nobody likes that ratio. We don't want to see less care, but we'd certainly like to see a lot more money uh, through the federal government for uh, basic research into Alzheimer's disease. A little bit of the science, a little bit of the science. Um, Alzheimer's is the most, form and, uh, most uh, common cause of dementia. Dementia is the overall topic. Alzheimer's is a piece of that, a big piece of it. Um, people over 50. 85% uh, or 50 percent of people over 85 have the disease and as you get older it gets worse. 
I think one of the things uh, on here that you might not realize, it's pretty new in the field, is that the pathology begins to develop almost 20 or 30 years before symptoms do. And uh, that's, that's a really important factor that most researchers are recognizing and definitely affects the way we think about therapies, certainly for early intervention. And uh, the challenges there are to identify who's at risk that early and what can we do about that. And neither one of those uh, issues has been resolved yet but there are a lot, a lot of people working on them very quickly. What they do know is that this pathology, for some people, a lot of Alzheimer's ultimate sufferers starts so much in advance. The risk factors. You know, as many of you probably know, in the old days, people just thought once you get old, you get crazy. And we know that's not true. We know that Alzheimer's is a disease. Uh, we also know that there are a lot of people in their 90s, even into their hundreds, that are just fine, mentally very, very competent, and, and cognitively very, very good. So something's going on here. And Alzheimer's was, uh, was discovered, identified, I should say, more than 100 years ago by Alwa Alzheimer, a Bavarian uh, researcher in about 1906, 1907. But for many, many years, it was regarded as a psychiatric condition. And part of that was because at that point, the psychiatrists, Jung, Freud, and so on, ruled anything above the neck had to be psychiatric. The other uh, issue was that it looked like, at that point, most of the sufferers were women. And you know, women tend to get hysterical, emotional, they have these hormones things. So it's probably not a physical deal. But Alwa Alzheimer had initially, in 1906, through his little old microscope at that point, identified the things in the brain that later we know are a causal for Alzheimer's, the plaques and the tangles. And he drew these in pen and ink sketches in 1906. But it took almost 50 years for the medical establishment to catch up with that and recognize the reality of it. So if you're talking about innovation and how hard it is to get a good, solid idea through a, uh, a phalanx of other beliefs, there's a classic example for you. This guy was right, and it took almost uh, 40, 50 years for other people to recognize it. Here are some, uh, Thomas Jefferson has four pillars. Alzheimer's has three, and they are the amyloid beta uh, uh, protein, which somehow, we don't know yet how, uh, cause the tau protein to create tangles. And that then creates some brain inflammation. So we have A beta, tau, inflammation. Now we've known about A beta for a long, long time. And because there have been so many clinical trials aimed at things to control A beta, that have failed, a lot of people, particularly in the media, say, well, that can't have anything to do with it then because we've been attacking this uh, protein for a long, long time, but it doesn't seem to do any good. We keep failing. Well, let me take you back to the 20 years before notion because once you begin to attack this uh, protein 20, 30 years in, when somebody becomes symptomatic, it's too late. It's like giving somebody Lipitor after they've had a heart attack. Uh, it doesn't work. So more and more researchers are now looking downstream at what happens that 20 years before and how is it that the A-beta is doing what it is doing and how does it affect the tau tangles and how does that then affect inflammation. More specifically, it's a cycle. And those, what goes on in those arrows is the big question for researchers. They're pretty sure, most researchers, I think if you took the middle 70% of researchers, would say, yes, these are the three things that are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's pathology. Where the disagreements come is, well, what leads from one to the other to the other? And one of the things that we know is that there are a lot of genes involved in this disease, a lot of them, over 100. There are only three that are determinative 
And fortunately, that's a very small slice of the Alzheimer's population. One to two percent of people who have Alzheimer's have these genes that predetermine for sure that they're going to get it, and that's probably early. It's early onset. But for everybody else, the genes are in, increase risk, some of them. Some of them are protective, but not determinative. So um, when you talk about is it a genetic disease, yes, genes have a lot to do with it. But is it determined by your genes? If you have two parents or a parent and an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent, does that mean for sure you're going to get it? No, it doesn't. It raises the odds often depending on what those genes are. And let me just stop there to say that the art of understanding those genetics is still early. And uh, most of our researchers think that if you're going to want to know what your genetic profile is, specifically with regard to Alzheimer's, you really need first-rate genetic counseling, not just an over-the-counter genetic test kit. That's not going to uh, do it for you and probably give you some wrong information and certainly raise fears that might not be appropriate at all. So if you're thinking about that, um, go ahead and do it, but couple it with first-rate genetic counseling. I don't know whether they do that here at Thomas Jefferson, but uh, you do do that. So this would be a place to come if you were interested in doing that. So this is the riddle right here. These are the three bad guys, and what goes on in between affects those. Now we'll talk a little bit about the role of venture philanthropy. Um, venture philanthropy has to do, uh, in our view, with taking some of the principles of venture capitalism and applying them to philanthropy. Now, one thing I want to be really clear about to begin with is a difference between venture capital and venture philanthropy in our perspective is we, uh, Cure Alzheimer's Fund, don't take any intellectual property. We're not looking to invest in this research and get monetary return. That's not what we're doing. It's completely philanthropic. We don't take any uh, intellectual property. Part of that is pragmatic because most of our money goes to academic institutions. And once you start taking uh, intellectual property, it gets very, very complicated in terms of just giving the money to the institution. It becomes almost a contractual obligation. We didn't want to have anything between our money and the research. We wanted to raise the money as fast as we could get it to the researchers as fast as we could so that they could do what they do and not have a lot of other stuff in between. So no intellectual property. Um, the other reason, frankly, is because uh, the time it would take us to realize any financial benefit from intellectual property in this particular, particular enterprise is so long uh, that all of the other uh, stuff that's in between just isn't worth it. Our mission is to solve this as rapidly as possible. So we want to clear out any underbrush and anything in the way of us raising money and getting it to those researchers. The other thing we want to do is innovative ideas, development of innovative ideas. Uh, we think innovation is uh, all about meeting unmet needs with effective and efficient solutions. So. Anything that is, is outside of that, we're not interested in doing. We're not interested in incremental uh, improvements. We're interested in big improvements. And let's go back to the unmet need piece, which we'll visit later. There's that $2 billion that NIH uh, does is great. We've got to have that money and more. But that tends to be, for all kinds of reasons, a little bit more incremental. It's, it's hard to get risky, big ideas new ideas through an NIH process. It's also hard to get it through many of the big, um, advanced, well-established foundations. But for small, agile, flexible foundations like ours, uh, that's what we do. So we bet on people with good track records who wake up in the middle of the night and say, you know, things are going pretty well in my lab. I like this project. I like this project. I like this that's been funded by NIH. I like this that's funded by such and such a big foundation. But what if, what if I could show this thing, but I don't have any money to generate the data? That's where we started our, our, uh, our foundation, is trying to fund really good ideas from really good people that 
can't get the money to develop the data to support those ideas that then go on to much bigger, longer NIH grants. So basic research, we, we're not in drug development. A word about that, why is that? Well, 200 clinical trials in the last year and a half or two years for Alzheimer's, 200 clinical trials, zero successes. What does that tell you? It tells you we do not understand enough about this pathology yet to put the billions of dollars it takes to developing a drug. Now, uh, pharma has done that, and God bless them, because if they hit pay dirt, lightning strikes, we all win. That's terrific. But as you've read in the, in the uh, newspapers and seen in the media, pharma is pulling back right now. They think they've spent too much money, uh, that's too much risk, and they don't know enough about that basic pathology. So as you've seen some of the very big names in pharma say, we are putting our Alzheimer's research programs on hold until we can get more de-risked information and data from uh, philanthropic academic institutions. So it's places like Thomas Jefferson and other places that are understanding that triangle better before pharma will come back in. Here's a little map of some of the nonprofits that are focused on Alzheimer's disease. In the upper left-hand quadrant is us, and there are two of them there. One is Cure Alzheimer's Fund, and we fund primarily early stage basic research because of the reasons I just stated. Uh, our neighbor there, Alzheimer's Drug Discovery out of New York City, uh, funds things at later stage in that what's sometimes referred to as the valley of death where researchers have something they think is really promising, um, but they can't get enough money to start a clinical trial, get pharma interested, and so on. So that's what uh, Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation does. And from time to time, they and we work together where a researcher that we've funded does come up with a promising idea for some kind of an effective therapeutic. So we introduce them to the folks at the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Place, and they see if they can't put together a program to move it along. Um, we have some, in, down in the left-hand corner are some great big self-funded foundations. These are not, they don't go out and raise money. You won't get an envelope in the mail from one of those guys. They're, they're funded by very wealthy individuals or by groups of individuals, and they focus on specific areas of Alzheimer's. A lot of them fund the same kinds of researchers we do and uh, take the same kinds of risks that we do in, um, in awarding those grants, but they're different kinds of organizations. In the upper right-hand side are mixed organizations that do both research and care and advocacy, and we need all three of those things. We have chosen in that upper left-hand corner to do only one of those things because we recognized that the amount of money we were going to be able to raise was limited, but we wanted to focus it on fast, flexible um, approaches to research for Alzheimer's and let other people do the advocacy and uh, the caregiving for which they are better equipped than we are. And then uh, lastly, in the last bottom quadrant are organizations that are mostly advocacy, mostly advocacy. So they are conveners, and they uh, try to raise the public's uh, awareness of Alzheimer's disease in every way they can. So it's a, it's a, a big field, but not terribly crowded. And in fact, the total amount of money that this group raises, and it's a little hard to tell down in the left-hand quarter because those are not public foundations, so we really don't know how much money they have or they give. But as best we can tell, it's, it's probably uh, less than 100 million, all of these. And remember back NIH was 2 billion, and then they were giving 277 billion for care. So the amount that philanthropy contributes is not very much in terms of the absolute dollars. But in terms of the impact of looking at uh, innovative ideas that the other people won't fund, it's very impactful. It's a little bit about us. Our history, 86 million since we founded in 2005. Um, we've funded 383 researchers. You can see the, the number there. 
That's a little of our background. Here's our board. And um, as Donna said, we'll see a clip in a little bit of uh, Jackie Morby. Jeff and Jackie Morby uh, lived in Pittsburgh. And he was a vice chairman of Mellon Bank. She was a uh, director of TA Associates, actually the first woman director of a major venture capital firm. Uh, and they had been very philanthropic in the arts and cancer and so on. But as they neared the end of their professional careers, they asked themselves, what can we do that's really going to help the world? Um, what, what can we do that makes a big difference? So they settled on Alzheimer's quickly, as you'll see. If we can run the uh, video a little bit later. Her mom died of Alzheimer's. Uh, and so it was personal for them. But the other part of it was the economics. They realized that this disease all by itself would overwhelm Medicare and Medicaid uh, by the end of uh, this next decade if we don't do something about it uh, to retard its progress. So they were um, angry, they were passionate, they were impatient, and they reached out to other people like that who also had the means to do something about it. A lot of us in this room are angry and passionate, but we don't have the means. We've made other choices in our lives. But these people did. Uh, Henry McCants, down here in the, in the left-hand side, uh, was chairman emeritus of uh, Greylock, another big venture capital firm. His wife had early onset Alzheimer's. She's still with us after almost 15 years. Um, and he was uh, dumbfounded when he went around to all of the major hospitals in Boston and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Washington in 2004, five and six, asking, my wife has this disease, what can we do about it? And people said, nothing, really. A couple aspirin, maybe an Advil, there's some things coming out, really can't do very much. He couldn't believe it, neither could the other people believe it. Why has this been so slow? So the three of them reached out to other people similarly situated with similar histories and similar profiles and said, let's try to make a difference and let's try to do some of these things that I described before. Let's focus only on research, let's focus only on the basic research, let's run as slim as we can. Um, and let's try to remove as much bureaucracy as we can. And that's where the venture capital model comes in. So they took their prior experience, imposed it upon a philanthropic model, and said, we're going to pick the winners. And the venture capitalists among them said, we would rather have a B-plus business plan from an A-plus entrepreneur as opposed to an A-plus plan from a B or a C entrepreneur. So we'll take wacky ideas from proven people and fund those and support them. We won't just give them the money and walk away. We won't tell them what to do, but we'll support them. If the first try doesn't work, but it still seems reasonable, we'll come back for more. We go for the big idea, not incremental. And that's one of the big differences between big foundations in the government and small foundations like ours. We can take risks. We don't have a political constituency. We have a donor constituency. But the donors are like you. They're angry and they're impatient. And they want things to happen quickly. So that's what we try to do. Results over process, we minimize the bureaucracy. You know, for big foundations in the government, it takes a year, maybe more, to get a grant through. Uh, with us, it takes about three weeks uh, from beginning to end with a high integrity review process of peers. And uh, we have worked that process in such a way that um, uh, it's anonymous. It's not an old boy or an old girl network. I'll give you your grant, you give me mine. That's not the way it works. And most of our, our uh, approvals are iterative. Uh, most of the proposals come out a little different when they get funded than they came in because the review process is more an, um, an improvement process than it is a, a no or a yes. So uh, we've tried to make that process as, as good and as high integrity as we can, but also narrow the time scope. Because if it's a good idea, we want it in the, in the bloodstream of the research body as quickly as possible. Embrace risk and idiosyncrasy. All right, we don't want to go crazy here. I mean, there are, there are ideas that are a little off center, and then there are legitimately crazy ideas. We, we try to tell the difference. Um, and, uh, but we also will take more risks than most other people. I think that theme's come pretty clear. Um, idiosyncrasy, we do things a little differently in uh, the organization. 
to meet all of those goals that I specified. For example, we do not have an inside science person. Um, we have an inside PhD just recently, but her job is communicating the science that we're researching. So she can understand what these researchers are doing and talking about it and tell, it, tell that to people like me. We do not, are those board members, I, we don't have somebody in the organization that says what science we're gonna research. The scientists tell us that. And that's one of the tenets we decided from day one, is we would let the scientists guide the science, not us, not our own prejudices, not our own impatience. We read something in a journal and say, wow, that's gotta be the answer, so let's put a ton of money in that. No, we're not doing that. We go back to the scientists and we say, what about this? Is this a legitimate way to proceed? How much money do you think we should put in there? Okay, full stop. Those of you in this business would probably recognize, wow, that's a built-in conflict of interest, right? You ask these scientists where to put the money, guess where they're gonna say to put the money? They say, give it to me, because I've got all the answers. Well, that's not really true. Uh, a lot of them say, I do have an idea about this. But what we asked them to do was bring in a group of people, a consortium of scientists, who were experts in their field, but who did not all agree with each other, and build a process of review with integrity so that uh, on the one hand, the body of scientists that we work with can help direct the funding that we give, and on the other hand, they are a good peer check with each other. And when I go to administrative conferences or conferences of foundations, and I tell this story, people are incredulous. They say, that's crazy. You can't trust these guys. And our answer is, well, yeah, you can, because they're gonna save our lives, for one thing, some of our lives. And the other is, you gotta make a leap of faith somewhere along the line in this process. Uh, one leap of faith is, I'm gonna trust in bureaucracy. Well, okay, we decided that's not a good idea. We're gonna trust in the scientists. So uh, it is a different and idiosyncratic way of going about it. Um, there are some other elements of bureaucracy in our organization that we issue. Um, we have 20 people on our staff, which has lately grown from uh, about 12 or 13, and we try to keep that as low as possible. So th there are a number of ways in which we differ from most of the other people in our field, but it's a thoughtful difference, and we hope in the long run it'll prove to be the right choices. Focus on unmet need. I'm gonna come back and I mentioned that earlier. Uh, innovation, we believe, and risk taking is all about unmet need. There's no point in raising money from people like you and giving it to researchers for stuff that we already know about. So uh, we are in the business, and I think what innovation is about is meeting unmet need. And in this case, in Alzheimer's, the unmet need is really understanding that basic pathology. Why have those clinical trials failed? Why has it taken us over 100 years to discover this? What is going on here? That's an unmet need and we've built our organization to try to address that. Specifics, I've already touched on these, so I won't go through them again. Trust the scientists, fund the innovative, high integrity. Board, oh, board pays all the operating expenses uh, so that you donors don't have to pay me, which is good news for everybody. So our board uh, pays all of the operating expenses for the organization, and that's part of their commitment. Uh, it, it also makes for a lean organization because we know the people, on, we on the staff know the people who are paying our checks and uh, pay for the orga organization's operation. We sit across the table from them frequently. We, we know who they are. So that helps us uh, with the integrity of spending on the operations side. And I have to say our board has been generous in the other direction because when we try to be responsible and say, yeah, I don't know if hiring that next person, I don't know if we can afford that. Our board almost always says, we well, can't afford not to do that. If we're gonna raise more money for research and stop this disease, you gotta do that. So go out and do it. It's a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, uh, place to work, environment, where the end result is the objective and there's not a lot of stuff in the way. And lean operations I just addressed. Let me touch on some things uh, that we have funded, not so much to go deeply into the science, but to uh, try to stress the innovative nature of these. Alzheimer's in a dish essentially means taking an Alzheimer's brain and putting it in a Petri dish. 
making it. Why is that important? Because all of the Alzheimer's work essentially, uh, no, two, two kinds of Alzheimer's work. One is in silico, computers, computer simulation of what goes on in the Alzheimer's brain. The other is in mice. And some of you may know mice don't naturally get Alzheimer's. So you have to put the Alzheimer's in the mice, then study the Alzheimer's. This takes a lot of time. It's expensive. It's the way that labs have worked for years and years and years. And the mice can't quite uh, uh, recapitulate the Alzheimer's disease. They can't quite do it. Enough so that you can test things, you can learn about the pathology, but there are other things in the way. So researchers that we fund uh, said, well, why don't we strip that away and try to create the Alzheimer's pathology in a way that we can look at what makes, what drives that pathology and simultaneously have a mechanism for t testing drugs, compounds that might affect that pathology. So that's what they did. They replicated the Alzheimer's brain first by uh, creating the amyloid creation, then adding the tau, and then adding ways in which they could stimulate inflammation in a petri dish. What that did was tell them two things. Number one, that basic diagram of the three pillars is probably right. Those are the three things that give rise to Alzheimer's, and the, uh, uh, Alzheimer's in a dish really helped to confirm that. The second thing it did is to provide a much cheaper, much faster way to test existing drugs that might, atta uh, might attack the pathology. So there's, I don't know, those of you who know about drug libraries, 250,000 drugs in a drug library, and uh, to test, uh, through chemical analysis, some subset of those that's likely to affect Alzheimer's. Uh, it's a great theory. Drugs that are already out there doing something else might help Alzheimer's. Well, just think about running those through my, a mouse model. It takes you at least nine, 12 months to get it in there, get them cultivated. It's very expensive. It's not going to happen. But here, you can run a drug through in two or three weeks, some of them in a matter of hours to determine not how it works, but that, that it affects the pathology in some way. Once you do that and identify that the drug is, is effective or it affects the um, pathology, then you can take it out and put it in a mouse model. But meanwhile, you've saved a ton of time and a ton of money. So this is a tool now that's used in many, many labs across the world uh, that came out of research that we funded specifically at Cure Alzheimer's Fund. Women and Alzheimer's. Guess what? Two-thirds of Alzheimer's patients are women. And going back to my sort of facetious story about Alwa Alzheimer's and Freud and so on and dismissing all of that, we've known for a long, long time that more women than men get Alzheimer's disease. It was dismissed then later with a little bit more scientific minds by saying, well, women live longer. That's why they get it more often. That's why we see it more often. Nope, that's not it. When you uh, adjust and control for age, it's still true that more women than men get Alzheimer's. Why? We don't know. Um, many more people now, just in the last three years, are studying this than had studied it ever before uh, because it's such an obvious problem. It's a huge problem, and we don't know the answer to it. So we've taken it on. We have a consortium of researchers starting right back at the basics at what are the differences in the genetic makeup between men and women at the margin involved with Alzheimer's and sort of going from there. What are the differences and uh, what difference do they make? So it's a big deal. Here's a, here's a big deal. Remember I said amyloid is the bad guy uh, and most, a lot of people think it starts with amyloid. And one of the things, uh, there are several things that can trigger the, the amyloid. One is a traumatic brain injury. Another is stroke. Uh, oddly, things in the brain happen in the same way with either stroke or traumatic brain in injury that can kick off more production of A beta, but also genetic differences. Well, some researchers recently, and this is still controversial, but becoming less so every day, some researchers stepped back from all of that and said, wait a minute. You mean in existing in the brain is this protein that has survived literally millions of years of evolution and all it does is cause harm? Does that make sense from an evolutionary step? It must do something else. So they worked on it 
from what does it do might have a positive effect? And the short answer is it turns out to be an antimicrobial. That is to say, it attacks pathogens, bacteria, virus, other things that get into the brain. And if you think about it a little bit, you have this blood-brain barrier, which has amazing integrity, uh, and it's a lot stronger when you're young than it is when you're older. When you're older, things, it begins to leak through in a variety of ways, vascular affects it and so on. So there's a sort of a common sense theme that runs through it once you step back and say, okay, this, this protein was put in there in the first place to combat those microbes. But somewhere along the line, it goes haywire. And it gets wrong signals or it does it too much. What happens there? What, what's going on? So this is a brand new theory, as I say, is still controversial. And talk about innovation. The guy that first started writing about it is an Australian, of course. Um, and he started about 10 years ago writing about this and talking at conferences. And it was just like old Alwa Alzheimer's. Nobody paid any attention. In fact, it was worse than that. They said, Rob, you're nuts. That's just crazy. You mean amyloids to fight bugs? No, it's not. It causes Alzheimer's. Well, he kept at it. And the field is now beginning to come around and say, even the, the, the strong doubters are saying, well, all right, there's something there. There's, you, you got a point. There's something there. Let's investigate it. And other people are saying, yeah, that's, that's probably one of the ways in which this pathology can be kicked off. So it's another way, it's another lesson really in innovation and in thinking about the barriers that you have from a really good idea that might make sense, that meets an unmet need, uh, that needs to be demonstrated and proved and, and turns out to be effective. Genome Project is uh, simply, this is really easy, it's how many genes affect the pathology. And some genes uh, create more risk, some genes create protection. How many are there? Just how many genes affect this? And then the second question is, okay, once we've identified which those genes are, what do they actually do? So we're still in the problem. Most of the genes have, have been identified now, although every year a couple more pop out. Uh, but mostly the effort now from our organization as well as many others is taking those hundred plus genes and trying to figure out what each one of them does in this pathology. Are they protective? Are they, uh, do they raise risk? Do they work together? Are they independent? What are they doing? And what does that mean to development of an effective therapy? APO4 is the most dominant gene in Alzheimer's. Uh, and it creates a protein, APOE4, uh, that is in about 60% of Alzheimer's patients and about less than 40% of the population in general. It's one of these genes I talked about, when was it, two hours ago when we started? Sorry about that. Um, that if you have it, it increases your risk, but it doesn't determine that you have Alzheimer's. So if you get one copy of this gene, your risk is maybe four or five percent higher than the general population. If you get two copies of this gene, one from mom, one from dad, your risk is maybe 12, 15 percent higher than the general population. But that doesn't mean it's determinant. And relative to that risk, what are the other risks you're facing, uh, including getting hit with a bus, uh, other diseases? That's where you need genetic counseling help. Because if somebody just comes to you or you re get a kit and you say, oh my gosh, I've got two of these APOE genes, my grandmother had it, my aunt has it, I'm going to get it. Not necessarily. Your risk is higher, but not necessarily. And that's where you could really use some good professional help thinking about that. Vascular, we've known for a long time about vascular dementia, uh, and increasingly we find out that there's a relationship between the vascular system and Alzheimer's. Some amazing discoveries, which people here at Thomas Jefferson can tell you much more about uh, lately, the idea that um, there's a lymphatic system in the brain. How many years, hundreds of years, have we studied the brain and didn't know that? And recently, within the last three years, it's been determined there's a lymphatic system in the brain, a drain that comes out of the brain, just like in the rest of your body. Nobody knew that. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And if something can go out, something can go back in. 
So that's another area of investigation that people are looking at. How does that work? The, the microbiome, what is in your gut affects what's in your brain. Uh, not too long ago, most doctors, most researchers believed that everything above the neck was in the brain, had nothing to do with the rest of the body. Now we know that's not true. It's, and that also sort of defied common sense at the time, I guess. But now we know it's not true, that there, this is a whole interconnected system. And what goes on in the microbiome in your gut does affect your brain. So it's another breakthrough that took a long time to develop, and somebody had the insight to study it in a way that provided conclusive data, conclusive evidence, and now the field recognizes it and said, yeah, that's right. That's another thing we have to study and understand better. Quick word on charity watchdogs for philanthropy. Uh, very, very important. They uh, uh, develop all kinds of rubrics about what charities should do to, to uh, uh, Im improve themselves, and when people go on these websites to find out, let's say you're interested in supporting Alzheimer's research, you don't know anything about us, we're not a household word, but you go on to Charity Navigator, um, and you find out that uh, of all of these charity raters, uh, for example, we're number one in every category uh, because of the way that we operate. And uh, so these, these uh, Nav these uh, raters are very important in the industry. They can be sometimes misleading because of the uh, criteria that they impose, might in some cases inhibit innovation because they propose ratios and formulas that are sort of standards for the industry. But in order to make progress, you may want to, from time to time, violate one of those standards. So as proud as we are of that rating, and that brings donors to us, we also would consider stepping outside that if something that we would do would further our uh, goal of solving the disease but violated one of those ratios. Everybody wants to know these things. What can you do? Um, as you know by now, there's no white pill. Uh, and it's probably a while coming along, uh, successful interventions. But there are things you can do to keep you healthy. Uh, there's certainly evidence that the more healthy and the more stable that you are going into that age period, um, the better uh, you're going to be able to withstand it, maybe delay it a little bit. All those things, exercise, diet, Mediterranean diet. The, the painful thing about this is these are things we should all be doing anyway, all the time. So. There's no magic here, unfortunately. Uh, when we say exercise in, in these kinds of talks, immediately hands go up and say, well, how long should I stay on the treadmill and stuff like that? I, I, you, you just got to get out and do stuff and, and keep, your, keep your body toned, do as much as you can. Diet, socialize, kind of goes with learning new things. And that goes to these brain exercises that uh, crossword puzzles, Sudoku, and so on are fine, but those are retrieval exercises. And what you want to do is mental things that create new synapses, that create new energy in your brain. So that would be learning a musical instrument. If you're a singer, learn a new song. Don't just keep singing the old ones. Go to new music. Uh, meet new people. Have new experiences. Those are the things that keep the mind alive and uh, uh, able to uh, absorb memories as we go along more quickly. Reduce emotional stress. I hope I've done that today. Have I done that today or have I increased it? I don't know. But emotional stress is uh, increasingly seen to be a trigger. And that's where you get into things like meditation. People have written about that for all kinds of uh, conditions. Deepak Chopra's book, one of our guys, Rudy Tanzi, has worked with him. Rudy Tanzi is a deep, deep geneticist, very scientist, but sees the value in things like meditation and controlling your mind and so on. Uh, and sleep. One of the most important things is sleep. Eight hours of sleep doesn't have to be contiguous, but it has to be eight hours of good sleep. And the reason for that is because during that kind of sleep, that's when your brain gets cleaned out. And that's ordinarily in the healthy, balanced brain where the things in your brain that normally clean out the amyloid can do their job. But if you don't get enough sleep, you don't allow that natural system to happen as well as it should and it can sort of back up on you. So uh, that's an important thing to do. I'm done. Um, useful innovation, 
we think means new and effective ways to solve an unmet need. If you're not doing something that's useful, if you're not doing something that's new, if you're not doing something that's effective and meeting an unmet need, it's not innovation. Thanks. So we're going to do a couple of things. Can I, Tim, can I get you to hang over here? Because we're going we're gonna to do a little Q&A. No. But we're also going to try and get that, get that video. OK, up. But good. Let's, let's do some Q&A while we're working. Yeah, come on out and see if you can figure out how to make this thing work. OK, good. So um, questions, anybody? Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very uh, well-rounded overview. It taught me quite a bit. Uh, one troubling thing was that uh, despite the shocking paucity of funding by our government for research, one thing that was conspicuous by its absence was since there seems to be a gender-oriented oriented difference, is anyone looking at just the X and the Y chromosome proteomics of the X and Y instead of looking at the entire genome? Yes. Yes. The other one was in some part of Russia there is it's famous for people living easily over 100 years. Yeah. I was wondering if that could be used as a negative control. That, that's a really good uh, comment is that there are pockets in the world of places who live a long, uh, people who live a long time, relatively healthy lives. And um, uh, so that's one, those are populations that people are interested in studying. You're absolutely right. And along with that are these people that I mentioned earlier who live well into their 90s and 100s right here in this country. Uh, what's different about those people? Uh, so yeah, those, those uh, things are. And then the obverse is also true. In certain places in the world, there's a much higher incidence of Alzheimer's. And one of those places is, is in Peru. You've read about it with the Peruvian family that um, researchers from WashU and other places, Washington University in St. Louis and other places uh, have worked with this family because they all get um, early onset. They have those presenilin germ genes. How did that happen in, in this big extended family? So there are two sides of that argument, neither one well understood, but both being addressed. Hey, um, so I think I understand that, that your funding and research, the, both where you get the money and where you spend it, is all within the U.S., is that correct? No. No. Uh, no, we're international. Our uh, cosmic headquarters are in, uh, right outside of Boston. And um, we draw funding from around the world, mostly in the United States, and provide funding to researchers, mostly in the United States, but a growing number abroad. So could you tell us something about um, how all of the different organizations, you, you, on your slide at least, I think many of those were U.S. There are other um, global Alzheimer uh, philanthropy centers yes. in other countries and in other continents and things like that. So, um, and it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because you're all having this awesome mission that everyone is focused on trying to solve the problems of this disease. Um, but in the same time, you're sort of competitors in a way. So how do you work together at all or coordinate or not? Or, so it, or where it, does it all come together? It's a great and embarrassing question. Um, the first part of the answer is there are organizations abroad, not as many. Typically, uh, governments tend to invest more in this kind of thing than our government is doing right now, which sort of takes the wind out of the philanthropy in those kinds of places. But the real answer to your question is, how do all of these organizations collaborate? And they don't very well. And the reason they don't is because of money. We're all fighting over donors. Uh, now, remember the lower left-hand uh, quadrant over here with the great big private foundations that we don't know how much money they have? They don't. So they're good partners because we can share information, we can share resources with those people. But I have to say, and I'm, uh, it, it's embarrassing, that the field itself, uh, the philanthropic organizations, particularly those of us that raise money, are not collaborative. It used to be that, um, and some of you may still think it's the case, that researchers were not collaborative. You know, you heard about this siloed effect and they didn't talk to each other. Well, that's not true anymore. They exchange data, they work together, they publish papers together. They're way ahead of us as organizations in collaboration. And it's, it's one of our frustrations. I mentioned some kind of 
uh, collaboration between us and the Alzheimer's Disease Foundation, where they're at one end of the drug development continuum and we're at the other. But there's not very much collaboration. There should be a lot more there, and there just isn't. So the answer is money. It's, it's, the, it's the struggle for donors. And we are funded primarily by individual donors. We don't have government grants. We don't have big foundation grants. We have no corporate grants. It's individuals like you all here. All right, we're going to take another stab at, okay, good. at showing There's the video. There's a gentleman back there, and I'll get to you. And died in 1981. My mother had Alzheimer's and died in 1981. It was really difficult to realize your mother was not logical anymore, not able to understand things, was becoming like a child. And I felt terrible about it for her and for my father, who was extremely diligent in taking care of her. At the time, they didn't say Alzheimer's. I had to introduce the idea that I'd read about Alzheimer's, and that's what I thought it was. The baby boomers are now aging. We know that at 85 years old, 50% of people have Alzheimer's. So to find a cure is extraordinarily important. I was a venture capitalist for 30 years started helping young companies grow and succeed. Taking that approach of a venture capitalist toward a philanthropic organization was a new concept for many people, I think, at the time we started Cure Alzheimer's. With Cure Alzheimer's, we call it the venture approach to solving a difficult problem. We back the best people. We're backing the top scientists in the field with Rudy Tanzi leading the collaboration of scientists from all over the country. We have a sense of urgency. When you're a venture capitalist, you really are urgent, and we're not willing to say, wait for a year or two. We feel that we're making tremendous progress that would never have been made if we hadn't started this fund. It's fascinating to look back 10 years ago and know that we knew about four genes, and now we've found 100 genes 20 of them which we're focusing on and learning new things about them every day. We, the board and founders, are paying all operating costs. All donations go to the science. We're not building overhead. We're building science. Others can help by donating money, but there are other ways besides money. People have given referrals to media outlets, People have referred other interested donors to us. The more money we have, the faster we can find a solution to this disease. Thinking about the future, we're very optimistic that we're going to be finding a cure, I think within five to 10 years. And our greatest goal for that to happen is to be put out of business. really have to see this because it's just so remarkable that this rem this woman and her husband decided you know what we're not sitting around taking it anymore we're just actually going to go do something to make something happen so it was incredibly moving for me to watch that and that's the context in which we began there was a question over here from this gentleman yes, please yes you, you're you're located in boston which correct is a wonderful place to be for this sort of thing uh, and there's corporate um, uh, you, yours is a, a philanthropy right. um, a venture, but there's corporate venture in yes. Boston. Yes. Other places too. Yes. Um, I hate to mention some places across the school field um, that do this kind of research, but um, uh, but if you could, if you could, if you could have a relationship, possibly not not a wall between corporate and and this, but if they go to corporate and they have requirements. Uh, uh, and limitations because it's somebody's money uh, and who wants a return. And they say, you know, you're not quite where we are, but, but we'll see you down the street. We won't talk about it, but we'll say, why don't you go over there? Uh, and, and maybe they could bring you up to a level where then we can supplement. Yep. 
Yep. You know, under something there. We, we, we have started in that direction. Let, let me, without belaboring it, just say that we've been working so hard at raising money and giving it to scientists and having these projects proceed uh, that we haven't uh, gotten a good idea about the rest of the world, the rest of pharma and corporate and so on, and now we're starting to do that. So uh, we are approaching other organizations. We are talking to venture capital firms, biotechs and so on, not about investing directly with us necessarily, although if they decided to do that, that'd be awesome, but more to say, look at the research portfolio we're doing here. Are there things in here that you might be interested in so that you would talk as a venture capitalist or a corporate entity with the researchers directly? We'll get out of the middle, but if there's value here that you think you can identify and grow, that would be great. So we're starting to have those conversations. Yeah. I think we have time for one final question. Anyone? Or we can just thank our guests and let them hit to the airport in this dreadful weather. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you all. Thank you all very, very much.